Um, here's a dumb question that professors ask sometimes. Uh, what do you think of the reading? Did you did you like did you like Rousseau? I've gone kind of, I've gone back and forth with students before over this. Some folks tend to think that like ah he's their he's their favorite writer. Not mm, maybe in terms of ideas, maybe in terms of style. I've also had students like tell me that like they dislike Rousseau more than anybody else in this class, worse than Kant even. And I'm like wow that's that's surprising. Um, Cards on the table. I really like Rousseau. I find him kind of frustrating as a writer sometimes because he's vague, but he also has a kind of a, I don't know, a flowery prose. And he's working with like very expansive ideas in a way that perhaps is like exactly what you'd expect from a French author. Um, maybe also starts to kind of like get at, at some sort of like deeper issues within philosophy that still rage to this day. This question about how precise should philosophical language be in philosophical writing. And Rousseau's not as precise as some of the other folks that we've read, like John Locke, for example, who can, who can be like very precise. He's refreshingly loose with some words where he's like, I don't care like which word you use. It all means roughly the same thing. Whereas Rousseau is kind of like using lots of words and you get the sense that like he has a very idiosyncratic idea of what these words mean. And like it's a little bit of a puzzle sometimes trying to figure out what Rousseau is talking about. But the little glimpses that he gives us of this puzzle of like what it's going to look like when it's all put together are kind of cool and kind of impressive in a way that like makes me a little bit more optimistic about what humans are capable of, maybe even like what, what human society is capable of. And this is also surprising for the social contract because in plenty of other places Rousseau is very – has a kind of very, very dark and pessimistic idea about what life in civil society, or so-called civil society, looks like. So all that is to say that like Rousseau is a little bit of a puzzle and sometimes a little bit of a challenge to read, but I find him to be a kind of an exciting and productive challenge. What do you think? Do you like it? Dislike it? Were you confused by things? That's one of the things that the quiz is for, to kind of like help be that check to be like, ah. So um, can you, do you remember any kind of like, can you pinpoint some of the confusions? What were things that you were like, I, I was pretty sure he was saying this, but it turned out that he wasn't? He would, would ask me something like a, which naturally, which um, uh, So one thing it might be like don't rely on your recollection. Go back to the text and and check and see if it's there. It's always possible, by the way, that I just miscode the answers on the quiz, and so like you got marked wrong, but you were right. That would be extra confusing. But l let me know if that ever happens. So for me, like um, I had to go back when he referenced. Um, I remember who he referenced about the state of war. Mm -hmm. He started it talking about somebody else's opinion, and then he went to his. Yeah. Think, like in the quiz when I first took it, my first attempt, that was the only one I got wrong, and I was like, what? And I had to go back and check. And I'm like, oh. It was Grotius, maybe, yeah. who like is like I I had to be like totally transparent. I had never even heard of Grotius. I'm not much, like much for political philosophy, certainly like early modern or medieval political mm -hmm. philosophy. I had never even heard of Grotius until I read Rousseau, and I was like, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this is always a this is always a a a. a a bit of a difficulty for folks who are approaching philosophical writing for the first time. Aristotle is one of the worst on this, where he'll just go on for like pages and like chapters of books just talking about other people's views or like all of the possible views on something. Aristotle loves to like start a project by saying like, let's see what everybody has to say about this and we'll just go on and on and on. You're wondering like, when am I going to get to like Aristotle's idea? And it's not till the very end that Aristotle's like, okay, so here's why the other things were wrong and here's what I'm saying that's new. But yeah, this can throw us, right? We're used to kind of reading and thinking to ourselves that like whatever the author is writing, that must be what they think. Mm, not necessarily. In fact, good philosophical writing, I would encourage you to adopt this strategy yourself. Explores as many sides of the issue as, as it can, right? And uh, kind of will inevitably, at first, address the possible ways of thinking about something that are different than what you're going to propose ultimately. Anything else? Really similar still, right, to Hobbes and Locke? Uncannily similar? 
It's called the social contract, obviously. We're going to talk about another social contract. There's also a reference to a state of nature that we're in before the social contract. After the social contract, we leave that state of nature, go into civil society. It is perhaps unsurprising that all of these figures are referred to as social contract theorists, uh, like social contract theory, like folks, um, social contract theoreticians, maybe theorists. That's the word I'm looking for. Social contract theorists, and uh, it's the dominant political philosophy in early modernity is social contract theory. Rousseau is starting to get into something that looks maybe a little bit. He's still like solidly. The title of the piece is The Social Contract. He's still a social contract theorist, but he's doing it in a, a slightly different way and a very interestingly different way than Hobbes and Locke were. And as usual, the thing that we're going to be trying to keep a really sharp eye on today is like, where are all the places that he's zigging instead of zagging? Where are all the places that he's saying something that's different than what we saw in Hobbes and Locke? Um, before we get into, I guess, the details of the social, book one of The Social Contract, how about a little, like, Rousseau the man? Because he's an interesting fellow. He's definitely, I didn't go into a whole lot of details about the life of John Locke either time that we read him, just because his life story isn't nearly as interesting as Jean-Jacques Rousseau's life story, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, first of all, let's say this about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Have you guys ever seen a portrait of Jean-Jacques Rousseau? Guy in the tub. Oh, in that painting, The Death of Marat? The guy in the tub is Marat, not Rousseau, um, as the title might suggest. Uh, right time period about, we'll notice that like the social contract is written in 1762. Another big treatise that Rousseau is pretty well known for, which is I think still widely talked about in philosophy of education today, a piece called Emile, um, also came out in 1762. And if you know anything about like European and American history, like this is like right on the doorstep of like everything just going crazy for a little while. There are going to be like revolutions galore. And so like all of these like rumblings that we kind of see this movement from one of the, the things that we're tracking perhaps is just how permissible this idea of like overthrowing a government might look, right? Just how how we can fragile the authority of government might be. For Hobbes, it was very, very strong, and the idea of a revolution was unthinkable. For Locke, we see, like, suddenly a, we're a whole lot more permissive of revolution. Um, and with Rousseau, we're going to, I think, what we're going to end up with is this idea of, like, how are we not constantly in a state of revolution? Because the bar that he's going to set for a legitimate government is really high. It's, like, crazy high. This is when I say that like there's something kind of inspirational about Rousseau. It's like he sets it crazy high and seems to think that like it is attainable. And if it were, we'd be like, that would be awesome. If like civil society was like Rousseau was talking about it, that would be so good. But he also acknowledges that like this is really, really hard to attain. Um, so yeah, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the man. Oh, I was asking about the portrait. If you uh, haven't seen a portrait of him, I, I recommend it. Because uh, he's incredibly good looking, especially for a philosopher. Are you looking at one right now? He's a, he's a hunk. He's a hunky guy. Espe and like I said, especially for a philosopher. While you're checking it out, MK, you can also check out like portraits of Jean, Jean Locke. Jean Locke. Jean Locke. And uh, he's just John Locke. He's British. Um, and David Hume and all the other people. Thomas Hobbes is like, he's not like particularly ugly. John Locke is like really ugly. Yeah, well, that's not the only thing. But yeah, he's also got kind of like a bird face, too. He's got a like weak chin, big nose. Um, this is, um, maybe Nietzsche said, <laughs> said uh, that like it's perhaps unsurprising that you see a lot of ugly philosophers because like these guys are like weak and, weak and bodily sort of. Uh, yeah, and so like, yeah, of course they retreat into the life of the mind because like the life of the body is not treating them very well. Um, Socrates, of course, like notoriously ugly, even like brings it up himself in conversations with people, sometimes in very flirty ways where he's like, ah, my interlocutor here is like a young, beautiful man with like all of the, all of the kind of like strange quasi pedophilic sort of like baggage that comes along with this in ancient Greece. Um, but it, yeah, Socrates is always saying like, well, you are young and very beautiful and I'm very ugly and, and. And his interlocutors will sometimes. Socrates got like a smushed in, a pug nose, big bulging eyes. Yes. And most philosophers 
are not very good looking in present company, excluded. Um, <laughs> Um, Rene Descartes also, like, if I was sitting next to Rene Descartes on a bus, I might think about moving. <laughs> but Jean-Jacques Rousseau, an incredibly good-looking guy. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was born in 1712, so I'll let you do the math to figure out how old he was when he wrote the social contract. Um, it's 50 years. He was 50 <laughs> when that happened. Uh, so he was born in 1712 in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. He does not stay in Geneva. Uh, there is no Switzerland, by the way, at this time. It's kind of a loose conglomeration of city-states. Um, but Jean-Jacques Rousseau refers to himself. He identifies as a citizen of Geneva like for the rest of his life. He moves all around. He goes traveling to France and to Prussia and to England. And he, he, he's, he's, in many ways, he embodies this life of just a citizen of Europe more so than a citizen of any particular state. But... Even to like his old age, just before he dies, he still like signs books for people, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a citizen of Geneva. He takes an incredible pride in this. And if you know anything about Switzerland, too, at, at, the, at the time, Geneva was like this, and it still is uh, to a large extent, one of the few plausible representations of like a pure and direct democracy. Like Switzerland like commits to democracy in, I think, in, in ways that other other democracies would look at it and be like, that's like that's an extreme democracy. Like everybody votes on almost everything. Instead of this kind of like, oh, we represent you know, we we elect representatives who will then like vote on our behalf, sort of thing. This is what we have in our representative democracy here in the United States. Um, Rousseau's mom died when he was very young. This ends up being a, a I think a, a pretty serious event in his life. Um, He's kind of left to his own devices. He becomes a, an apprentice to an engraver when he's very young. He's not treated very well. In fact, I think he's physically abused by the engraver. When he turns 16, he kind of like sets off on his own. He meets up with uh, somebody whose name I never remember and have to look it up every time. He um, establishes a relationship with, while well, he's 16, by the way, a relationship with a uh, 30-ish, early 30-ish years old woman named uh, Francois Louise de Warrens, um, who takes him on as a ward, as kind of like a, a, a kind of a parental figure to him. Um, there's perhaps some reason to suspect that she takes him in because she's interested in converting him to Catholicism from Calvinism. He grew up a Calvinist, and she's trying to, to convert him to Catholicism, and has some kind of like modest success in this, although the, I think there's probably good reason to be suspicious of exactly how strong any of the theological commitments that Jean-Jacques Rousseau has are. Um, by the time he's 20, this is not a parental relationship with the Warrens anymore. Like, they're lovers. And so, like, that's a little strange and weird, perhaps. He, perhaps, yeah. I mean, if the standard is like what's going on in Athens in like third century BC, then like, uh, I, I guess it's not that strange that mentor figures and lovers are like things that get kind of like mixed up. It's totally frowned upon today in like the modern university, for good reason. I don't want to like be like ambiguous about that. Um. So yeah, and his uh. In his early 30s, he eventually kind of leaves de Warren's and, and is striking out on his own, starting to make a name for himself as like a thinker and a cultural critic. He weighs in on like the arts, he weighs in on philosophy, he weighs in on like political matters. By the time he's 30, he strikes up a relationship with a seamstress, somebody who's notably like not of any sort of nobility, which is still a thing in Europe at this time, uh, strikes up a relationship with a seamstress, uh, Therese Levasseur. And uh, this is a kind of on and off again relationship that he has with Levasseur for like the bulk of his adult life. Together they end up having five children, every single one of them whom gets given up for adoption. Yeah, so Rousseau, like real father of the year candidate right there, has five five different children with this woman and gives all of them up for adoption and then has like the balls in 1762 to write this treatise, Emile, which is about how to bring up your children properly. Hmm. 
we'll see there's some significant criticism of Rousseau in like lots of different respects. For, uh, we'll see from Mary Wollstonecraft um, when we read her, who is British, and maybe part of the explanation for this is like as Rousseau kind of bounces all around Europe, occasionally coming back to like meet up with Levasseur and like have another baby and give it up for adoption. Um, Rousseau manages to both like impress people and make friends really, really fast, and then like almost as quickly alienate people and make enemies. He has like all kinds of like little temporary friendships that spark up, and part of this is maybe explained by uh, the fact that like Rousseau seems to be the kind of guy who just like he speaks his mind like without a whole lot of filter, and this gets him into trouble a little bit. He speaks with confidence on all manner of things. And this is the sort of thing that might get him into trouble. Um, he had a he had a, a, a brief friendship uh, that eventually led to a falling out with Voltaire when he was in France. He had a brief friendship that eventually led to a falling out with David Hume when he was in England. One of the things that contributed to his falling out with Hume was that like Rousseau Rousseau started talking shit about like British people and British culture while he was a guest in England. This wouldn't be the first time that a French person like said, like, English culture is shit. But, like, Rousseau said it, and while he was a guest, and then, like, people started criticizing him, and Rousseau was like, whoa, people are, like, out to get me. And it's like, well, maybe if you didn't act like an asshole all the time, like, people wouldn't be so out to get you. And he thought that Hume should have defended him more than Hume actually did, and maybe Hume should have, maybe he shouldn't have. doesn't really matter. It just, it does seem like, do you know anybody like this? Somebody who's, like, very charismatic, very smart, they make friends really quickly, but they also make enemies very quickly. And sometimes, like, the two are, there's like a revolving door between, like, who's a friend and who's an enemy. I dated somebody like this for a while. <clears throat> so, yeah, Jean Jacques Rousseau, the very good looking guy who had five children that he gave up for adoption, made all kinds of temporary friends, eventual enemies. He gets invited to Prussia by, uh, by the emperor and uh, stays there for a little while and then alienates the people of Germany. What else can we say about him? His death is also a very interesting story. Does anybody know how Rousseau died? Rousseau died of a cerebral hemorrhage that it's kind of difficult to pin down exactly what caused this cerebral hemorrhage because he I think there's a record of him having sustained like several head injuries over the course of his life because he was also like a little bit of a daredevil. This is one of the things that Hume liked so much about him. He was like, that Jean-Jacques Rousseau guy, he's like crazy. There's a story that Hume tells. Maybe this isn't as impressive. There's a story that Hume tells about uh, a, them being on a boat ride, on, on a ship ride across the English Channel, and the weather was getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed. And... Uh, Hume spends the whole trip in his quarters because he's like, it's just nuts up there. There's like waves crashing and lightning and people getting tossed about. And Rousseau spent the whole trip on the deck, just kind of like in the rain. He's also, we get this maybe impression in reading what he says in the social contract. It's a lot louder in other works like Emile. Um, Rousseau is kind of the beginning of this turn from early modernity, this kind of attitude uh, this attitude towards the emerging science and uh, the promise of our ability to tame nature and subdue it into something that's better than what nature is. This is loud and clear in the social contract. But there's something about Rousseau that's also starting to turn towards um, a, a movement that follows this kind of this kind of early scientism of early modernity and eventually turns into a kind of romanticism. So like the picture of like Rousseau with a square jaw on like the deck of the ship in the rain is like, this is a perfect picture of Rousseau. Died of cerebral hemorrhaging. That's what I was talking about. Um, uh, the most likely candidate for what caused this was that he was out walking in the street and a nobleman was going by in his carriage and alongside the carriage was running the nobleman's dog, which was a big dog, a Great Dane. Great Danes are really big dogs. And the Great Dane jumped up on Rousseau and knocked him down and he bonked his head and a couple days later died of cerebral hemorrhage. So, big tough guy. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, done in by a Great Dane, ultimately. I know, there you go. Beware of Danish dogs. Great and small. All right. That's a sketch of the life of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Let's get into what's going on in the social contract. Book one, 
We're just kind of like working through book one today. Book two is for our next session. But I think we're going to get a pretty good sense of like the broad strokes of what it is that Rousseau is up to just by looking at what he's doing in book one. Starts, as is the style at the time, we've seen this before in other treatises, it starts out with a, a little preface uh, that offers an introduction and a statement of his goals. Right? So we get this kind of like intro and goals. And what is Rousseau's goal for this whole project in the social contract? This was a quiz question, was it not? This sounds totally like the kind of quiz question that I ask. I don't really have questions. Yeah, what is he, he like? Yeah, Rousseau. He like yeah. He starts with a question. I'll go ahead and give you a, a, a kind of a little bit of structure here. He starts off with a question, and then he adds a constraint to like what a good kind of answer would look like. Ian, you got something? Yeah. So it's not so much like whether it's. Legitimate, although that's really, really close, and that's a very similar question to the like to the sorts of questions that our other social contract theorists are asking as well. Whether civil government is legitimate, under what conditions is civil government legitimate? Um, Rousseau's asking just a little tiny twist on this. The way that Rousseau asks it is, he says, "Can there be a legitimate civil government?" Which immediately suggests that he's a little bit pessimistic about this, right? He opens up. Well, we have like one more thing to say about like his his intro and his state his statement of purpose. But before we remark on that, it might help to jump ahead just a smidgen to the very beginning of chapter one of book one of the social contract, where Rousseau opens with like one of the more famous lines that any philosophical text opens with, which is. Man is born free. Yeah, you guys finish it. Man is born free. Everywhere he is in chains. Yep, and everywhere in chains. You can see why people think of him as a little bit of a romantic, that like man is born free. Man's natural state is freedom. But yet, everywhere that we look, man is in chains. Why is this? Like, surely he doesn't mean literal chains here, right? It's not the case that everybody is literally chained up. It's not even the case that, well, is it the case that everybody's literally enslaved? What does this mean? That man and, you know, forgive the sexism, humans, right? All humans, born free, yet everywhere in chains. Make sense of this for me. What does he mean by this? Yes, so listen. Yeah, you have to follow the rules of society, which is a bummer, right? This is a form of enslavement. Like, you don't get to do whatever you want when you live. Like, every human, almost every human, right? Yeah, a man is born free. And everywhere, so just about every human who lives under civil, soci- uh, under civil government, which is pretty much all humans, are in chains. They don't get to do what they want to do. They have to follow the rules, rules that they don't want to follow. If this is the case... Can there be a legitimate civil government? Hard to see how, if man is born free, yet everywhere in chains. Unless we somehow think that a legitimate civil government is going to be one where people are enslaved, where people are in chains, metaphorical chains, of course. It's hard to see how there's going to be a legitimate civil government. And just to kind of like check everybody's intuitions on the basis of like the reading that you've done for book one of the social contract, does Rousseau think that like it's totally legitimate for a government to enslave its people? Does he think that? No. No, he doesn't think that. So perhaps a little bit pessimistic. And we get another sense of this in the constraint that he puts on what it would mean for there to be a legitimate civil government. Rousseau says, I gotta try in this attempt to articulate whether or not there could even be a possible legitimate civil government, I'm going to try always to unite, how does he say it, to unite what right allows with what interest demands. K 
can there be a legitimate civil government? If there was, it would have to be the sort of government that always was able to unite what right allows with what interest demands, so that justice and utility don't at any stage part ways. We can see that there's a tension here. What right allows with what interest demands. What's the split there? Like, why is there a tension between what right allows and what interest demands? Or the way that he phrases it immediately after this, so that justice and utility don't at any stage part company. Do justice and utility have a tendency to part company? Is what is just always going to be what is useful? Example? Say say what? Killing like killing cows for like the betterment of your, your community. Ah, and is this unjust or is this just? I suppose so. It's not useful to kill cows. Incredibly useful to kill cows if you eat them and then make shoes and belts out of them. Ah. And maybe just like ignore the cows. Like we do this with people as well, right? It is still 16, uh, 1762, by the way. Like England doesn't have a serious abolitionist movement going and won't until the early 19th century. The United States is going to take a lot longer to figure that out. But that seems like that's not just. If there's something wrong with like killing people or killing cows for food and belts, or just enslaving them, or otherwise like treating people badly, I suppose that's useful. That's useful for some, not particularly useful for others, for the ones who are being used, and certainly unjust. What about justice? Is justice occasionally not particularly useful? <coughs> or does justice fail to meet people's interests, what interest demands? If we're going to have a just and fair society, are some people's interests going to have to be ignored? Is everybody going to get... Here's a, another way of thinking about this. Is everybody going to get what they want in a just and fair society? No. So this is why everyone's born free but everywhere in chains, right? Because in order to live in a just society, it can't be the case that everybody gets what they want. But Rousseau says that like we're going to try to keep these two together. This is what it's going to mean in order for us to have a legitimate civil government. This is also one of the reasons why I talk about this being in, in, a little bit inspiring because Hobbes, for sure, Locke, less so, but still in significant ways. Let me just open that a crack for the people who are coming back in. I don't want them to be locked out. Seem to indicate that like, in order to live in civil society, sometimes you're just going to have to understand that you can't always get what you want. Yeah, but if you try some time, you get what you need. But like, but like, but what about what I want, right? If I don't get to do what I want, how can we talk about liberty? After all, Locke says this is all that liberty is. This is all that being free is. Is it's, it's getting to do whatever you want. Rousseau says we're going to have to discuss some sort of social order and explain how that social order can come about. But it can't be justified by force. It can't be justified by force. Nor can it be justified by nature. Because we don't have a social order by nature. By nature, just like all of the other social contract theorists, by nature we're in the state of nature where there is no social order, there is no civil government in the state of nature. So this is not something that just kind of like emerges naturally all on its own, nor is it the sort of thing that we can discuss as being legitimated by force or coming about according to force. And this is uh, immediately Rousseau begins to launch into some discussions about like, all right, so what kinds of models for governments do we have? What is like, what is the conventional thinking? This is what Sarah was, uh, maybe exactly the sort of thing that Sarah was complaining about. And as a matter of fact, like, yeah, this is where he discusses war. It's in this, this vague conversation where he starts talking about, here's what people have to say about the legitimacy of government and where social order comes from. He discusses the prospect that, like, just like Locke does, he says maybe this is, maybe it's about families because families are kind of like a naturally occurring social order. So maybe we should look to families 
And he eventually says, for reasons that are, I think, fairly similar to the reasons that Locke gives, like, not quite, but there's something that he does highlight in the discussion of families that maybe is an important key for what's going to come later. Um, he talks about appeal to force. He talks about this, uh, he talks about it as like kind of the right of the stronger. In the discussion of warfare, he, he explicitly calls it the right of conquest and eventually ends up talking about slavery as well here. Let's start with families. Um, why are families, and feel free to like borrow from Locke because it's going to be the same sort of justification that Rousseau offers. Why are families not a very good model for a civil society? Children are at least a little bit dumb, right? This is the whole point of parental authority over them, is that they aren't capable of making their own decisions. But, yeah, eventually they are. They don't stay that way, right? Parental authority is only temporary. Eventually it runs out. Is this what you are going to say, Ian? Yeah, yeah. And... Can we all agree that this is a sort of authority that is like completely unwilling? Like nobody checks to see if kids are okay with being parented by their parents. And if they said like I don't, I don't want to, like I want to like be off on my own, do we say like oh well, very well, I, I don't want to get in your way, little five-year-old kid. Like go on and like be whatever it is you want to be. Sometimes I guess people do parent like this. Is this good parenting? This is one. Re this is one way. Yeah, children die all kinds of ways, but yeah, that's that's one way. It's not safe, right? It's not safe to let children make their own decisions, and we just don't care if they object to parental authority. Is that a good family, by the way? One that relies on parental authority in order to get children to comply. What's a better way to keep a family like? in a well-functioning state. This is parental authority. This is an appeal to force, right? The right of the, the so-called right of the stronger. Love your child. Rousseau talks about this too, right? He says love, like love is what like keeps families going. Said the guy who gave his children up for adoption. Love is what keeps families going and, and is the reason why if you ever see somebody who like reaches the age of maturity but doesn't like tell their parents to go cram it with walnuts and like say like ah, I'm off on my own now like people who maintain good relationships with their parents and continue to respect their parents opinion even after they're old enough to say like I'm able to make my own decisions like my parents walked into my house and my mom said like you need to clean your room there's a part of me that would be like I'm a grown ass man I don't got to clean my house. You said when you have your own house, you can listen to the music that you want to listen to, right? And you can, like, make your bed if you want to or not, but as long as you live under my roof, like, like all that stuff. Now I live under my roof. So there's, like, a moment where that goes through my head, but then there's another moment where I'm just kind of like, but I, I love my mom, and I care about her opinion. If she says that I should clean my room, I seriously consider, like, yeah, maybe I should. Yeah, she's right. I am a little bit of a slob. And always have been. It's love that keeps those sorts of things together, even when parental authority evaporates. Keep track of that. Something very, very similar is going to be at work in the sort of civil society that Rousseau is, is talking about. And in fact, we've remarked from time to time how like Hobbes and Locke, are, they, they're kind of sort of approximating some way of like getting people to care about their neighbors, but it never really turns into like a fully-fledged golden rule. And Rousseau is getting much, much closer to this. We've got a social contract theory that has like all these little elements of communitarianism in it as well. So we get this conversation about families, but then there's this conversation about appeal to force, about this right of the stronger or right of conquest. And of this, Rousseau says, that's the most ridiculous use of the word right that I've ever heard. There's no right of the stronger. I mean, maybe think back to like those of you who've read book one of the Republic. This is like an argument that gets put forth relatively seriously by a fictional character that Plato makes up 
Thrasymachus, who says, like, this is what justice is. Justice is whatever the strong people say. And maybe this is, like, an account that's some, a backwards-looking account of, like, how it is that governments happen. There are some people that are stronger than others in the state of nature. Sure, we're all roughly equal according to, like, abilities, both mental and physical in the state of nature. But some people are going to have slight edges. And those slight edges are going to, like, turn into the sorts of things where, like, now they have more power over, over everybody else. And Locke discusses this. This is maybe how we get the first kings. Whereas Locke is going to like object to absolute monarchy as basically just a form of slavery, that this is really no different than the state of nature. It's just everybody agrees that like one person is scarier than everybody else. This is exactly what Hobbes, Hobbes is sitting there thinking, like, that's what the Leviathan is. That's every civil society. And Locke says, like, no, nah, no, nah, that's a terrible civil society. It's barely a civil society at all. In fact, maybe it's just the state of nature all over again. This idea that like there's a right to dominate and control other people if you are stronger than them just describes what does happen. It doesn't talk about what should happen. It has like no normative content. It has it has no prescriptive content. It has there's no value to it. It seems like rights what, have you ever complained that your rights were being violated? Have you ever asserted a right? Not successfully? Well, it's not necessarily that like people are going to go, oh, well, in that case, like have all of your rights. But when is it that people make a claim to a right? Do they make a claim to a right when they're getting what they want? No, they make it. Rights are to protect the weak. There's no right of the stronger. That's not, that's not any kind of right. We put it in scare quotes here for a very important reason, because there's no right associated with this. This just describes what does happen. There's no prescriptive content to it. There's no, there's no way of talking about what should happen. This is what rights do. Rights are supposed to talk about what should happen. So no, if your appeal to, the, uh, to like why a social order is justified comes from this idea that like somebody is stronger, somebody has conquered somebody else, and this is what provides some right for them to rule over the people that they've conquered, Rousseau says, that's not a right. That's just what happens. Nobody respects that because it's right. It's not even clear if anybody respects that at all. You might not challenge that kind of like faux authority, but only because it would be foolish to do so, right? Because you might die in the process. This right of the stronger just describes like how people do dominate one another. It doesn't talk about like whether or not that form of control or that form of governance is legitimate. And that's what a right is supposed to be talking about. We saw this a little bit with Locke. He kind of, he injected this idea of rights into the conversation, rights of nature that like have some serious purchase, natural rights that have some serious purchase even in the state of nature such that like if those rights are not being served by civil government, we have a right to say like, all right, forget you, sovereign. I'm out. I'm going back to the state of nature where I can fend for myself even better than, than I'm fended for here in civil society. And here Rousseau is doing a similar sort of thing in order to reject this idea that any kind of legitimate social order comes from the so-called right of the stronger. And this then bleeds into a conversation about war, and it bleeds into a conversation about slavery, and all kinds of efforts that some people have made to justify even certain forms of slavery that come from war, which are that, that like, you've conquered another people. Maybe they were even the aggressors. They attacked me first, and in order to subdue them, in order to stop them from attacking me, I had to conquer them with force. And now, well, we have two options. Either I can kill them or I can keep them my slaves. This was a, like the, one of the biggest justifications for slavery throughout Western history has been like these people were conquered and we can't just leave them to their own devices because they're pretty salty about being conquered and they're going to come back at us. So like we have to keep them subdued. We have to enslave them. And this is perhaps a better option than being killed. We might even offer it to them. We might say like, look here, like you're a prisoner of war, you have two options. We can either kill you or we can enslave you. Which would you prefer? And most of us are gonna say like, I guess I'd rather be enslaved. What would you prefer? Would you prefer to be enslaved or killed? Well, Some people say killed. Oh, interesting. I think I'd go with enslaved. I'd go with enslaved. Yeah, you would too? Yeah, I, that's exactly why, yeah, this is, this is, mm, this is, 
maybe why it's like a bad a bad idea to give this deal is that like this is a slave you're always going to have to keep an eye on. As a matter of fact, Rousseau even points this out. He says if your legitimacy, uh, if like your so-called legitimacy, if your claim to dominate somebody else is based on strength, that strength is fickle, right? You can keep an eye on people for a, a, at least a little bit, but as soon as your back is turned, they might rise up against you and try to overtake you and enslave you. If given this option, by the way, if anybody were ever to choose being enslaved, maybe maybe it's for the reason that Ryan gave. Maybe it's for the reason that I was thinking of, which is like, well, at least you're alive, right? I've seen enough people who had like lives worth living under slavery. Not literally, just kind of historical accounts. That I don't think I'd rather be dead than enslaved. But still, this is not really my choice. This is a false choice. This is not a real choice. This is a coerced choice. This is a choice that I'm forced into, even though you might say, like, you could have chosen death. And like, yes, I had the other option. But the fact that I had this dilemma in the first place is a product of somebody asserting their so-called right to control me just because they were stronger. And there is no real right like this. There's no legitimacy to it. So there's no legitimacy to like that form of slavery where I opt to be enslaved rather than killed. Does this kind of like resonate with us, by the way? That if I give you a choice between like either you die or you're enslaved, you might think to yourself like, well, I guess in one sense I, I always have a choice. Like I can always choose to die instead. But this is not a real choice. This is a forced choice. It's not freely chosen. It's not freely chosen. Yeah, Matthew? Yeah, it might be an act of prudence, yeah. But I don't know that we would necessarily say that anything anything right came out of it, right? Anything just came out of it, right? I don't think we'd be able to say like, oh, well, I don't know why the slaves complained. They got what they wanted. We offered them death or slavery, and they chose whatever they preferred. Yeah, who are these, who are these like complainy, whiny people who like get what they prefer and still think that there's something wrong with it. Like, yeah, there's something obviously crazy about that sort of justification. All right. Oh, Rousseau says one other thing about slavery that is like pretty noteworthy. He goes through a laundry list of folks who have justified slavery in one form or, or another. Hobbes gets a call out. Caligula gets a call out. Grotius gets a call out. Aristotle gets a call out. And Rousseau makes a, I think maybe, was this a, a quiz question? Rousseau gives a kind of like a little bit of a left-handed compliment to Aristotle where he's like, Aristotle was kind of right about one thing. Aristotle said that some people seem to be born to slavery, that uh, some people seem to be only suitable for slavery. They can't actually make judgments for themselves. We were just saying this about children, but maybe we think this about, oh, I don't know, backwards cultures that we go and conquer. And we're like, ah, look at them. They're like, they can't really fend for themselves. We have to take them in and care for them with a sort of a parental authority that never goes away because there's something about these people that they're just like not suited to freedom. And Rousseau says, yeah, there are some people like this, but it ain't natural. We beat it out of them. We make them unsuitable. When we enslave somebody from birth, we destroy the part of them that would have been capable for, of like taking care of themselves. And this does not justify that slavery at all. This says like we've done this incredible violence to this person. So yeah, you might be able to make claims that like people who have been enslaved for their entire lives, if you were to let them out on their own recognizance, they might not do too well. The same way Jack was suggesting, like, maybe we use a cow model, and this just comes to mind because we've been talking about, like, animal rights in my environmental ethics class. Sometimes people will say this about, like, this is why it's okay to basically enslave cows. Like, I don't, I don't know if it's, like, really all that much of a stretch to describe the conditions that we submit cows to as I slavery. I don't know if dogs would be, are children enslaved? Yeah, maybe because, like, eventually they grew out of it. Dogs are, yeah, dogs are maybe more companion species. Dogs enjoy the relationship that they have with us. Most dogs do. Not all dogs. Some dogs might be enslaved. But a cow on a factory farm that's being, like, raised for slaughter. Seems like we just keep it around so that we can exploit it. That's kind of slavery, right? And sometimes people justify this by saying, like, cows are not suitable for life in the wild. You can't just let all the cows loose and expect that they're going to be okay. They'll die pretty quickly. First of all, I don't know if that's true. But second of all, we made them that way. 
Perhaps like we incur some responsibility to take care of them. We don't get to say like, ah, they're naturally like suited for like being enslaved. And you're like, we made them suited to being slaves. It's not natural at all. Okay. Let's get into the whole social contract business. But before we get into the social contract, I need a little more room, so I'll erase this bit. Nothing really brand new so far, right? This all seems like pretty standard social contract theory fair. Even the stuff about family, or like we saw that with Locke. The stuff about slavery. Ooh, Rousseau says slavery's bad. Everybody said slavery was bad, with the possible exception of Hobbes, maybe. Eventually, we're going to get this social contract and talk about what that is. But before there's a social contract, there's an earlier agreement. There's a first agreement. That's the earliest agreement, right? You can't be earlier than first. There's a first agreement, and it ain't the social contract because the chapter on the social contract happens after the chapter on the first agreement. What is that first agreement? What needs to happen, according to Rousseau, before we can even make a social contract? That was not rhetorical. Shall I ask it again? Sometimes when I ask a question and then I like wait a long time for answers, like the, somebody raises their hand and they're like, what was the question? And I'm like, all right, maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't hear it because you didn't know I was about to ask a question. What is this first agreement that Rousseau talks about that has to happen before the social contract? And maybe in searching your memory you can find the answer. I can think of like one place that's a more reliable source for the answer. That's right, the ceiling. Yeah, look at the ceiling. Maybe it's up there. No, uh, is it on your desk? It might be on your desk. If the text is on your desk, what's the first agreement? It's the title of a chapter. Pretty easy to find. Want a little bit more of a roadmap? Chapter 5. Book one, The Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, published in 1762. I ain't giving this to you. Like if, if we have to like wait out the rest of the class, I'll do it. <laughs> it's gonna be awkward for the folks at home. I apologize, video viewers. A people have to become a people. Yeah. This is, thank you. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> Everybody thanks you. The people at home, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Individuals. Uh, so, first of all, it might be, like, you have to be, this is Rousseau all over the place, just like Kant was. You have to be really, really careful about the way you phrase these sorts of things. Because if we say, like, a people has to become a people, we're like, a people doesn't have to become a people. A people is a people. That's just true by definition. That which is, is, and that which is not, cannot be, right? Yeah. So, like, yeah, a people already is a people, but a group of individuals, a bunch of individuals, has to become a people. And for those of you who are keeping track, this is one of the big moments where we get something new from Rousseau. This is something significant. In order for there to be some sort of legitimate social contract, a bunch of individuals, like you can't make a social contract between just a bunch of individuals in the state of nature. This is different. Like Hobbes didn't talk about this. Locke didn't talk about this. They both seem to have like glossed over this and assumed that like any group of individuals who are self-interested and rational are going to get together and be able to form some sort of social contract by which they form the sovereignty that represents the authority of civil government. An authority that comes from the consent of the governed, maybe? A tacit consent, according to Hobbes, that like no rational person would deny because it's always better to live under civil government than it is to be in the state of nature. A, an ongoing sort of consent, as Locke describes it, such that like if you ever check back in and you're like, ah, I don't grant my consent, Locke says, like, well, then leave. Like, you can totally overthrow them. Like, you can do this. This is allowable if they're not actually providing 
for the security of your life, liberty, and property. And Rousseau seems to be saying, like, this is way more complicated than these folks are making it out to be. A bunch of individuals has to become a people first. And there's no, like, formal agreement. This first agreement isn't the sort of thing where, like, everybody kind of looks around and they're like, oh, so we're a people, right? No, they have to kind of get a sense that, like, this, like, the whole group is a thing. Is that clear enough? We're a class. I don't know if you like experience this in all of your classes. Do you feel a sense of community in your classes? We made no social contract. This is a very authoritarian environment, by the way. Like, I, there's a little bit of a kind of like, if you don't like it, you can leave, I suppose. This ain't high school. You paid for it, right? Yeah. So you don't have to do it, although you paid for it before you found out what it was like. So like, maybe there's some buyer's remorse from time to time. Have you ever been in a class where, like, you, by the end of the semester, you're like, like, we're a, we're, this is a thing. Like, we're a group of, like, we're a team, maybe? We're a community? There doesn't have to be any kind of, like, formal making of rules that everybody consents to. There's just this kind of, like, vague and tacit and unspoken sense that, like, hey, you know what? Like, we're all in this together. That there is such a thing. Like, maybe it's a mental construct. Or maybe this is just kind of the nature of like the relationship between parts and wholes. But like individually, we're parts of a whole that is a thing. This is what a people is. MK. I feel like it's more complicated than people that have been in school together for a long time. Like in high school, I just really didn't care for anybody. But I felt like there was like some sort of community. Like it's like someone hated each other, but like you accepted it. Like it's like you just lived with each other for like for so long. Families like that sometimes too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I would say that like I hate people in my family. There are some that I recognize that like, and maybe this is kind of like what you're getting at with like people that you didn't particularly care for in your high school community, but like you recognize like I got to find a way to get along with them somehow, right? Because they're not going away. recently had an experience with a neighbor that was like this, where I was just kind of like, boy, it'd be great to just be like, like, see you later, but like, no, not, so, like, literally, yes, see you later, see you every day when I walk my dog. <laughs> like, you're not going away. We got to find a way to, like, to get along, because, like, this is a thing. We're a people. And this has to happen before there's a social contract. It's necessary to create a social contract. It's necessary to create a sovereign. It's necessary to create some sort of like civil society. Once we've done this, then we can initiate a social contract. But you're not going to be able to trust people. This is very different, by the way. Remember Hobbes said like people have to be scared into compliance, right? They have to be like in order to feel like they can get over this inherent mistrust of one another. We have to have a big scary leviathan, right? I have to be awed into compliance. And Rousseau is taking a very different approach where he says, like, first you have to kind of, sort of, at least a little bit care about one another. You have to kind of, sort of, like, have some sense that there is a community, a natural community. Families are like a natural community like this, right? It's not civil society just yet, but a natural community must form. Locke talks about this a little bit when he says it's possible to have peace in civil society. It's possible to have cooperation. Sorry, not in civil society. Well, it is possible to have it in civil society. It's also possible to have it in the state of nature for Locke. And whereas Locke doesn't go into the details behind this, Rousseau is starting to flesh this out a little bit more. He says, like, there has to be a sense of community. A group of individuals has to become a people. And only then can we make a social contract. Perhaps this is contrary to things that like Hobbes and Locke said. Perhaps it's just kind of like a little slight spin that adds a little bit different flavor to something that ordinarily would be very, very similar content. But Rousseau is very careful to point out that like the social contract that gets made is not the creation of some sort of new power.
Nothing gets invented in the social contract. It's easy to read Hobbes this way, by the way, right? That like we invent an artificial person that gets imbued with all of this authority. And maybe we say like, well, it's not really invented because like that authority comes from the collective wills of all of the people that make up the Leviathan. That's like that's that's the beginning of this idea that like the authority of government comes from the consent of the governed in some way. This is not the creation of a new power. Rousseau says that it's the consolidation maybe, or like uh, I've got better words in my, yeah, that's exactly what I said. It's the consolidation of individual power and will of all of the people who are coming together, all of the various individuals that are like the parts of this whole community. Maybe a better word than consolidation, though, and I think this starts to get uh, like considerably more at the spirit of what Rousseau is up to and why it might be different than what Hobbes is talking about, perhaps even what Locke is talking about. But maybe instead of consolidation, we could use a word like it's the coordination of individual powers and will. Of all of the members. That's not new. It's not the creation of some sort of new power. It's the consolidation, maybe even better, the coordination of all of these powers. It's pointing them all in the same direction. Have you ever done like a, some sort of joint practical project with people? Have you ever tried to assemble furniture with somebody? Do it by yourself? I do it by myself sometimes too. Why do you do it by yourself instead of with other people? You know, you can like when you have like multiple people. So like now you're kind of getting in each other's way. I started putting these pieces together, but they started like putting things, and like they didn't go together the same because we're not on the same page. Not necessarily that she's better than you, but just that it's it's yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, but but more like it's just inconvenient to try to like coordinate a whole bunch of people. But if we are able to coordinate, we're capable of more, right? We have more power, we have more skill, we can get bigger things done, but it does require that like we're coordinating with one another. And in order to do that, you can't just do whatever you want, right? You have to check in with other people, make sure that like the way that I'm doing it is consistent with the way that they're doing it. I have to maybe putting together furniture is a bad idea. How about ensemble music playing? You can't just like let everybody do whatever they want. You have to pay attention to what other people are doing. You have to like back off and give other people space sometimes. If you don't like ensemble music playing, maybe team sports. Team sports, like you can't be a team. You can't be a musical ensemble. You can't be a couple. You can't be a family. You can't be a people unless you're already starting to like navigate this space of recognizing that like I have to restrain myself a little bit, otherwise we're not going to be able to coordinate our efforts. Everybody can't be left to their own devices on a team. The team has to be functioning together. They have to all be pointed towards the same goal in a way that like they start to spontaneously self-organize and like start and at the this point of the social contract, we do better than spontaneously self-organize. We formally organize. We start making rules for ourselves. And so far, it looks like it's this sort of thing where it's just kind of like, ah, oh, it's just kind of happening naturally, right? Everybody recognizes that, like, oh, we're a team. And, like, we're all imbued with this kind of, like, camaraderie and team spirit by which we're kind of like, oh, no, like, you go first and then I'll go. And, then, like, it's going to be easier that way. We're going to be more coordinated this way. But we know that there's a big problem that's associated with this because, like, not everybody wants to be a team player. And sometimes for good reason. Because you're looking at the way that the team is doing things and you're like, yeah, I could do better myself. And maybe you're right. <laughs> There's a big problem that's associated with this that Rousseau points out. And this is like the problem that needs to be solved. We've already got some sense of like what he's doing that's different. There's this idea of a people that you have to be first. It has to kind of like present itself organically in order for a social contract to even begin to make sense. But there's this big problem here that Rousseau is, is identifying for us that says, like, how can we do this in 
a way that ensures that there is no loss of liberty in this process. Because as soon as people feel like their liberty is being constrained, as soon as they feel like, ah, I can't do what I want to do in this team setting, they're not going to want to be a part of the team anymore. They're not going to like function as part of the team anymore. That All that team spirit, all of that kind of like sunny, like, oh, everybody's working together, and it's just like naturally falling into place. We've recognized that this doesn't just spontaneously happen. It takes more than a semester, perhaps, for this to happen, or it takes like the right kinds of events for all of us to go through together. That sort of trust has to be built up. There's a big problem that's here, which is how can we do this in a way that ensures that there's no loss of liberty such that nobody is kind of in this community and thinking to themselves like, I don't, I don't like it. I don't get to do what I want. Everybody needs to be thinking about this as cooperating with one another is the way to get what I want. The big solution to this, so there's a big problem, and then Rousseau says, all right, so here's the big solution. I want to get the phrasing on this one right. Direct quote. The big solution to this is that we need to see the total alienation of each associate with all his rights to the whole community. This is how we're going to ensure that there's no loss of liberty. There needs to be a complete alienation, a total alienation of each person with all of their rights to the community. This is way different than Locke. Locke said that there's like a partial denial of like your liberty, right? He says you lay, down, you lay down a little bit of liberty to get more in return. It's just a good deal in a good civil society. There's no total alienation of the individual. Rousseau is saying what we need is the total alienation of each associate with all of his rights to the community. Um, Anybody in this spot with me right now? Because he just said, here's the big problem. How can we do this in a way that ensures that there's no loss of liberty? And it's like, well, you just need to like completely give up like all of your rights, like yourself and all of your rights to the community. That way there's going to be no loss of liberty. And I'm li listening to this, and John Locke is probably listening to this and saying, this sounds like a complete loss of liberty. What's that? Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like, it's not a loss if you do it willingly. Yeah, it does feel like it's, it's a technicality. And also, this is a little bit utopian. We kind of, like, mentioned that Rousseau is like, man is born free and everywhere in chains. Like, if he's going to be describing the possibility of a legitimate civil government, there's a pretty good bet that he's thinking to himself, like, there haven't been any yet. It's like, ah, this is what it would look like. It would be like everybody willingly completely alienates their identity and like all of their rights and gives them over to the community. Like totally, a total alienation. We're thinking to ourselves like, how does that work? And we might ask like serious practical questions here. Like how are you going to get people to do this? A parasitic hive mind bacteria? This is surprisingly not the route that Rousseau takes nor is genetic engineering or brainwashing or anything like that. Or subduing people into compliance by, like, uh, I don't know, like opiates of the masses, like television and Facebook and stuff like that. Maybe. There's a way of kind of interpreting this that I think is a little bit better than total alienation. This is exactly what Rousseau does say. But I think that there's a way of interpreting what he's saying here. Maybe what we're looking for here is, what we're looking for is a total identification. Of my individual will with the common good. 
or my own personal interests instead of my individual will. Let's make it my individual interests. There needs to be a complete identification of my interests with the interests of the community, with the common good. There cannot be any separation of these two. This cannot be understated. Cannot be understated? Yeah, it can totally be understated. This cannot be overstated in terms of its importance for Rousseau. This is what leads us to this key concept. I don't think it's, it's just not possible to understand Rousseau's take on the social contract without understanding what the heck the general will is. He gets a lot of mileage out of this concept, and it's not immediately clear what this is. In fact, it remains a puzzle. We're going to keep talking about the general will well into our next session. Because there are all kinds of little philosophical riddles about the general will. But this is what the general will is. This is the general will is this common good. And in order for there to be like a possibility of a legitimate social contract, in order for there to be a possibility of a legitimate civil society, all of the members of that society need to completely alienate, ah, sure, if you want to think about it that way, they need to identify their own interests with the interests of the collective. Rousseau employs some really interesting metaphors here in order to, to kind of like elaborate on what's going on here. Um, he talks about, I think that probably the most productive of these is the body politic. Uh, he also plays around with the etymology of republic, sometimes referring to like res publica, the public thing. We can think of like the republic, Roman republic. Um, sometimes he plays a little fast and loose with kind of citizen subject language, where he says citizens and subjects are like the same things in a properly functioning civil society, in a legitimate civil society. One where all people have, if we want to find other sorts of language, we have like the total alienation, the total identification. Sometimes I hear folks talk about this in terms of subsuming your individual will or subsuming your individual interests under the interests of the common good or subsuming the individual will under the general will. It's lining these things up perfectly so that there is no conflict between them. This is the magical move, right? This is, maybe it's like a little too magical. Maybe it's a little too utopic. Keep in mind that Rousseau understands how hard it is to get this. He's setting the bar crazy high for a legitimate civil society. He's not so pessimistic, though, that he thinks it can't be done. He still thinks that it's like a worthwhile philosophical project to try to figure out like what would it be like in order for us to have a community where everybody follows the rules because they want to, because they all understand that these rules are good. Well, in order for that, we would have to have good rules, right? You're like, I don't object to the good rules. I only object to the bad rules. This is what we all think, right? My problem with the legitimacy of government or the authority of government isn't what they tell me to do, isn't when they tell me to do the things that I agree with. It's when they tell me to do the things I disagree with. So maybe the problem there is with the rules. But what we're going to definitely see a lot more of in book two, but like it's already in the post here. Like it's already in the works. The furniture's already in the room. Rousseau's just going to rearrange it just a little bit. Is this recognition that like perhaps this hinges at least as much on the people as it does on the government. Perhaps this hinges at least as much on this kind of like mental state. There's a kind of like a psychological dimension of like what makes a people fit to be ruled by good rules. You could have the best possible laws. Rousseau is going to say this in book two. Like you could have the best laws. If you give them to shitty people, you will not have a functioning civil society. There needs to be this, at least an openness or a willingness to be ruled by good rules. To think that like it is possible that I can completely identify my own interests with the interests of the whole. And this is not that foreign of a concept. I was talking about the analogy to team sports. Anybody participate in team sports? Is this how it works? Yes. Like there's just, there's no I in team? Unless you're a there is a me in team. They're like, yeah, there's totally a me in team. But like the team can't be a team if there are people who say like, my interests and the team's interests are slightly different. 
serious. And that's a shitty team, right? That's a team that falls apart. Yeah, they're out to pad their own stats rather than making sure that the team wins. And that is a shitty team. That is a team that is not functioning. And no amount of, like, good rules are going to, like, if you do have those sorts of rules that force people into compliance, nah, now maybe more man is born free but everywhere in chains, right? This is the kind of civil society where everyone's like, I don't, I don't, I don't like being ruled by the rules. <laughs> We've got to find something where people are interested in being ruled by the rules. That's the clock bell. But don't pack up yet because there are, like, a couple of very... Not, there are a couple of very big things that we're going to pick up with at our next meeting, but I want to get them on the board here first. One is this just downright puzzle, and maybe this is a cop-out. I, I don't know what to make of this. I, I'll be totally honest. Like This is the sort of thing where like when I read it, I'm just like, ah, Rousseau, man, what do we do with people who aren't? willing to do this? What do we do with the people in our community who cannot identify their own interests with the interest of the common good? Oh, better than set them free. Yeah, yeah. Those who don't comply all will be forced to be free. And I don't know if you read that and thought to yourself, like, what kind of bullshit Orwellian doublespeak is that? because I don't know if that's a thing, to being forced to be free. But maybe one clue to this is this distinction between different kinds of liberty that Rousseau discusses around the same kind. When he's, when he's uh, I think this is chapter 8, uh, the chapter on civil society, where he says, look, there's natural liberty. But what we get in exchange for natural liberty, which we kind of give up, and you're like, how can we do this in a way that ensures that there's no loss of liberty? We give up natural liberty, and what we get in exchange for that is civil liberty. And it's a better liberty. The way that Rousseau talks about this, this is something we saw a little bit with Locke as well. Uh, Rousseau kind of describes the distinction here as the, it's the difference between possession and property. And there's... Just in case you were thinking to yourself, like, yeah, all right, maybe you're trying to sell me on this idea that civil liberty is somehow better than natural liberty. But then Rousseau adds, like, one more kind of liberty to sweeten the deal, and he says, you also get this in civil society, in a legitimate civil society at least, you get moral liberty. And moral liberty is really nothing more than a human being's ability to rule themselves, to be subject to their own rule. Because newsflash, and Manuel Kant is going to hammer this one into the ground in his groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. I guess it's a good place for a, a groundwork to be, to be hammered into the ground. But Kant is going to say, doing whatever you feel like doing is not freedom. Being a, some might say, a slave to your passions, right? Think about somebody who's an addict. An addict who does what they feel like. Are they free? Mm, not clear that they are. In order to really be free, you need to be subject to your own rule. Some restraint is required in order for there to be real freedom. This is what's going on here in civil liberty and moral liberty, is there's this recognition that, like, I am my own rule. I'm not subject to no rules at all. That's not freedom. I'm subject to my own rules. I am my own sovereign. And then we, think, we might think to ourselves, like, but then how is there a community? Ah, because there's a complete identification of me and the community. There is no difference between the interests. There perhaps is no difference between, like, there might not even be a significant difference ontologically when everybody is really living in a legitimate civil society. Thank you guys so much for sticking around a little bit extra. We'll pick this up on...